right here in front. This is the Vancouver Art Gallery currently right now. Um, over the past about four or five years, this street here has been a temporary closure through the summer. And we've had a Viva program, uh, it's called, and it's, you know, developing placemaking in the city and there would be a temporary installation here every year. Uh, it would be out for about three months and the street would reopen for transit and cars. So it was this long going discussion with the public about what could we use this space for. And just recently it was approved to finally close it permanently. And right now we're going through engagement with the public to find out what does this space look like. Um, it's an interesting site because it's actually on structure. There's a ice rink down below the street. And the province of BC owns like the buildings on either side and the underpasses. So just from a bureaucracy standpoint as well, it's just a lot of different partners that play at this space and a lot of people feeling ownership for it. Um, but it'll be a great addition to our downtown. We're really looking forward to it. Um, and as you can see, we're coming down the Portland bike lane. So it's a two-way bike lane on one side of the street built in 2010. Um, at the time, there were huge uh, you know, huge backlash in the city and pushback. It was one of the main election issues back in 2010. Uh, you know, people opposed to the bike lanes coming into the downtown. Businesses worried about how how that would affect them. Um, since then, what we found is pedestrian traffic on Murphy Street increased about 20% compared to other streets in the downtown. So we have an ongoing pedestrian survey where we count pedestrians, and there's more people on Hornby like a bigger increase on Hornby than anywhere else in the downtown. And interestingly enough, the side of this, the sidewalk next to the bike lane increased even double as much as the other side. So not only are bike lanes good for bikes, but they're green pedestrians to this side of the street and people are actually wanting to walk there more than they did like one of the park cars. Uh, you'll notice that as you're coming down along Hornby Street, that all of the turns across the bike lane are protected. So there's a right turn pocket for all right turning motorists and there's traffic signal phasing to split that, to split that out. Um, we found that Dunsmuir Street, we didn't use the traffic signal phasing and we didn't see vehicle bicycle collisions. So when we built the Hornby Street out, bike lane after, we made sure we put that in and now that's kind of standard practice in the city to separate out those turns, those conflicts, especially on a two-way bike lane. Uh, yes. Was that parking before? This was parking before, so we were removed half the parking on the street, uh, meters park. And one of the big things that helped us, there was 300 uh, parking spaces on street, we removed 150, you know, a huge backlash around that. And one of the things that we did as part of that study is we counted all the off-street parking spaces within a block. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but it was five to 10,000, you know, in terms of underground parkades. The other thing we did is we asked did a MOBA uh, on-street survey with people and found that less than 4% of people actually parked on the block that they were shopping at. You know, most of the people on the street were walking, had walked there, taking transit, you know, even more people biking, and people that had parked, parked more than three blocks away. So this concern around front door access was really, a, you, know, you know, people felt it was a concern, but it wasn't reality in a downtown context of trying to find parking. Oh, sorry. Hey, question. Hey, I noticed there was not a, a very strong demarcation between the, the two different ways. Is that ever an issue of kind of oncoming bike traffic, or are people just trying to get to um, I think I think here we haven't heard too many issues. Uh, we do it at the intersections approaching. Um, in other parts of the city, where we have high, even higher bike volumes, like on the seawall. You know, where we have maybe 6,000 people a day, 7,000 people a day. We have had it started to demark that um, a bit more, just to you know reinforce that you should stay on the right. Um, some of that also is to tell pedestrians that they're entering a road, you know, to make it look more like a bike lane than a pedestrian path. So, um, yes. Uh, yeah, so where it was raised, uh, we didn't modify the drainage, and it was just, that's basically where we raised it. So when we built this bike lane, it was a temporary installation in 2010. So we didn't do any drainage, but it, the ramps are based on where catch basins would have been. And we raised it there so that people that were parking in cars could access the sidewalk. It was something we heard from our uh, Persons with Disabilities Committee. So real concern for people with walkers or wheelchairs that if they parked, how would they get up onto the sidewalk? So that's why we raised the bike lane in, in that instance. I think that's where there's parking. Yeah, so where there's parking, it was raised, and where there isn't parking, it has to be raised. Yeah. Yes. Are the cyclists required to use the lanes when they're present, or? Uh, I think technically, by law, they aren't. But, you know, we 
encourage everyone to use them because, yeah. But you do see a few complaints that people are riding on the road, you know, even on Hornby Street. So over time, that's become less and less of a year of that. But at the beginning, you know, there was, you know, opposition, you know, from people that were real, you know, road cyclists to using protective bike lanes. And I think as you build more and more, people are just getting used to it. sections where there were conflicts we had traffic control authority out there for the first week you know so people with the stop slow sign uh, this was really important specifically around the bike signals or the turn signal heads uh, we actually had to change um, out a bylaw for Vancouver to allow us to use the bike signal heads and they weren't recognized by any act within our province in terms of motor vehicles so we actually had to create law to say that that traffic signal meant something so we really yeah we did we had people on the streets that first week, just there all day to, to, monitor, to, just to talk to people and you know, lots of smiles. Yeah. People adjusted to it. Yeah. yeah, so loading zones, um, you know, if you come back and walk or you can ride slowly, you'll see in different areas, different zones that are still allowed for. Um, actually, you should come by the art gallery and you keep riding. This is one spot we had a real challenge. It's the, you know, it was the disabled parking space for the art gallery, also their move-ins. They have lots of moving in art, things like that, at different times. So you'll see that there's a pullout actually built through the sidewalk to accommodate that. Um, so yeah, different different sites had different, had different uh, reasons that we had to do it. One of the main reasons we actually built the bike thing on this side of the street when we first did it is the other street has about five hotels on it. And just trying to manage those valet parkings, Loading zones, that was just wasn't something politically that was possible at the time. Yeah. So, two questions. With the planters, are those irrigated or uh, yes, yeah, so they have a they have a reservoir in the bottom. I believe someone is actually upstairs in the tech part of the conference. So we heard water them every couple weeks. Okay. Yeah. And then from going back to the drainage question. Did you have to do a drainage analysis on uh, all the existing buildings when you rose that up to check to see if it was Oh, to make sure that blood yeah. would be flooded? Uh, yeah, so when we did it, our, our streets design department would ensure that we still have adequate drainage to keep things up. Uh, when it was raised, you can see just based on there is some puddling that happened, but it's, you know, it's minor. But it came down block by block, so it was really important to look at it. Um, can you comment on the sign that has the skateboarder on it? Uh, yes. So, um, just recently, I last like three or four months uh, we changed our skateboarding bylaw in the city to allow skateboarding in our protected bike lanes so I believe that we want to replace all the signs with the skateboarder just to say that but yeah okay uh, yeah actually yeah they're new <laughs> I haven't seen too many so. um, officially not in these bike lanes we don't have a speed limit nothing posted um, on our local street bikeways, it's posted 30 kilometers an hour for vehicles, which would also technically apply to the bikes. But not something we've heard of too much in the downtown area because it's hard to get a lot of speed with the traffic signals. Um, our seawall around the city has a very old bylaw which says it's 15 kilometers an hour, and there's a few signs posted around. It's a bit of contention right now, but what's going to happen with that? So, yeah. Any more questions? Or keep one, one about uh, this here. When they do that, maybe this is one of the things that will be discussed as part of the public input. Do you know if they're going to be allowing bicycles through here or not? Yeah, I'm, they, I think that's definitely up for discussion. Um, that's one of the main, I know within our office, uh, that was one of the big talking points is what does that mean? And we're we'll going through that with other plazas as well as you know, the difference between bicycle permeability that someone can get through versus a bike lane. So. You know, I think we're trying to find, find this spectrum where those should be public space that people on bikes can get through, but they do not have any sort of right of way or, you know, they need to yield people in the space. And different spaces will have different different uses. So, but I know that's a big discussion for this because um, in the future, you know, this is a, one of our high streets that so we want to improve pedestrian access. We'd also like to see improved biking access to the shop. So, yeah. Great question. Okay, so... Um, We'll ride up a 
couple more blocks, we're gonna we'll get to an intersection with the Dunsmuir bike lane. So we'll, then we'll make a right turn there, and we'll start heading out uh, to the east side of the city. So just keep your eyes open. There'll be a bike lane across the street, not to the right. Just follow that up. And, uh, <laughs> Alex is here. So uh, yeah, we just rode through the downtown. We're just on our way out uh, to the east side of the city. Right now, we're on Dunsmuir Street. Is that way, and this is called the Dunsmuir Viaduct. Uh, Dunsmuir Viaduct was built in the 1970s, and there's two of them, Dunsmuir and Georgia Street. And these were the beginnings of a highway network that was planned for the city of Vancouver. Um, this highway here, this, these two structures would have connected to a highway that went all the way out east, and including a third crossing to the North Shore. Um, effectively, the downtown would have, been a, would have been a freeway, and neighborhoods that were gonna go ride in also would have been those freeways. Uh, right now, I think in uh, 2015, council approved a motion to remove both of these viaducts. Um, we're gonna go and have a look at them from down below, but uh, removing these viaducts and building an at-grade street system will allow us to take, right now, there's the two viaducts and two streets down below them. We'll take those and we'll form them into one much larger road. And then, but what that does is it opens up about five acres for more development plus additional park space. So there's a whole visioning process going on right here about the viaducts. Uh, really exciting changes, like one of the biggest changes to the city to come in a long time potentially. Um, now, just a little story about the Denver Viaduct bike lane here. This was, you know, it happened very quickly when this installation happened. Um, for the Winter Olympics in 2010, both viaducts were closed for security reasons because both stadiums are right next to them. So they're really worried about just, you know, locking down security for the Olympics. When the Olympics ended, these roads opened up and we just shifted a barrier that was on one side of the road to the other and created the bike lane overnight. Didn't talk to anybody. It didn't impact the number of vehicle lanes, but it just, you know, just came in. And that was kind of the impetus of the whole downtown network was the Dunsmuir Viaduct. And because it was closed for a month for the Olympics, we said, well, you know, obviously we can put this in. And, but still the backlash on that, the number of phone calls we got about how could you take away a vehicle lane, I'm stuck in traffic, you know, all those arguments, even though we've just taken the barrier from one side to the other, because um, it'd been up for construction for three years. So, you know, again, you're fighting these perceptions, people see change and they don't know what was there before. So that's, I think one of the biggest lessons I've ever learned working in the city is, it doesn't matter what you're changing, people just notice the change. And how do you work them through that? Because even if nothing changed in their world, they just see change and they don't remember what was there before. Um, but yeah, so we'll ride along here and then we're just gonna head out into the neighborhood and we'll stop out there and have and, uh, another chat and kind of keep going, yeah. Um, you just talked to, you just gave an example of how you guerrilla or tactical yeah. urban or urban acupuncture, whatever the term is, mm -hmm. to create the bike lane, which yeah. was the impetus for all the other things. Where we just passed by, the uh, Vancouver Art Gallery is going to be relocated here. Yeah. How far in advance does the cycling infrastructure question get revisited? Because you, you're now going to have a major art gallery. Yes. Uh, so the question is just how far in advance do we look at our cycling infrastructure? Uh, we talked about the Vancouver Art Gallery, where it was where we stopped. Um, there's a plan to relocate it here. You can actually see that uh, mural wall. Uh, to build a brand new structure that's an at-grade parkade, turn that into a new art gallery with another public plaza. Um, and the answer is, you know, with our planning department and our engineering transportation department, we're always talking about what it could be in terms of recycling, where the cycling routes work and how they connect. Um, the reality is though, we never get into the details because things take so long that usually we're, you know, by the time we make a plan for when that will actually happen, you know, we actually built a bike lane on Beatty Street here in the meantime just this last year so we try to make sure everyone's talking about it thinking about it so that it's initially in the original policy but laying out the final details doesn't usually come until right till the end so it sounds you more like you're developing a culture of bike lane consciousness rather than line a line b line c i'd say yeah that's you know we're saying that it's going to be there and you know a lot of the time even with new developments that are coming in right now um, how we design the road has changed significantly in the last four years. You know, four or five years ago, we would have had a painted bike lane with a development. Now we're doing protected bike lanes. So, you know, we have final drawings we've given to developers to build, and we're going and redoing them all at the last, you know, the last year, basically, to say, well, that's actually not okay anymore. This is what we're going to build. So, 
we're trying to get more in the culture of doing less work, you know, way in advance and doing as much okay. final design work just before it gets built. Okay. And that's one of the advantages I think we have in the city of Vancouver is that uh, we have our own internal engineering design work team and we also have our internal construction crews. So we really work hand in hand about how these things are built that, you know, we're, we're trying to limit the amount of changes that can happen, but we are able to be more flexible in that because we can really talk to the people that are going to build it and find compromises to actually get the thing built in ways that meet our goals, which are ever changing, so that we can be more reactive. Yes. How complete would you say your protected network is? If an auto network is 100% complete, then how would you do um, I mean, that's a really hard to an answer. I mean, I'd say we're we're not very far along in terms of where we want to go. Um, there's lots of places into and neighborhoods in the city that you can't access at this point. I think downtown we're getting a better grid coverage. You know, we'll see some of it, but. Uh, when we come back riding, but you, you'll see these brand new bike lanes, they terminate about four blocks from where you really want to get to. So, you know, we're incrementally trying to get there and we're trying to push push the residents, you know, the politicians are helping us get, you know, incremental steps, but we're just, we're just taking what we can get and, you know, and saying, well, this doesn't have too much pain, create the obvious gap, and then we can come back for the hard part. Um, I think that's kind of some of the stuff we've been doing just because we want to, you just need to build, you need to get it built. So, you know, a lot of the time you can get bogged down in the hard, the really hard place. And, you know, we're just build, trying to get a network built wherever we can at this point. But yeah, a long way to go from where we'd like to be to develop the culture, especially with the new bike share system. You yes. mentioned doing regular counts. Do you track kids on bikes or whether they're riding themselves or being carried? And how much uh, is this network being used by kids? Yeah, I don't have any numbers with me. I can pull out some reports, but we do, um, Every year we have select routes where we do demographic counts. So we'll have manual people out there for 12 hours, counting the number of women, children, males, seniors, and then also you know who's pulling trailers, cargo bikes, trying to get that sense of change. Um, it's especially been important on new projects um, for us to show that before and after to council. So on the Hornby Street bike lane, you know, uh, what we saw, you know, again, not clear ups, but I think we went from 0% children to 4%. A huge change in the downtown, right? I mean, that was, um, and also what uh, we'll see it on the Burrard Street bike lanes. If you go right there, back in 2009 when those were installed, you know, back then it was about one third females, two thirds male riders, and you know we saw this about 25% growth overnight. And what we saw is that split went from you know one third, two thirds to about 40%, 60%. So we saw this huge influx of uh, women that actually were choosing to ride because it was more comfortable. So it's really important for that story to say who's ride, you know, who's riding on this infrastructure, not just the number. Do you compare that to changing demographics in the community? Do you see more families living downtown now because of other changes you've been making to make the downtown more livable and stuff? Uh, you know, I, I think it'd be hard to get that pulled that way, but I know you know there's more families moving into the downtown. Yeah. I think it's the other side. So we're saying yeah. you know just with the residential boom that okay, well we know that they're there. This you know we'll ride by actually as you go over the viaduct. There's a brand new elementary school being built that you'll see on the left. I think this is covered in yellow cladding right now. So there's elementary schools being built in the downtown to accommodate families. So how are those kids getting to school? How are you know how are families doing that and navigating without a car? So that's really part of our narrative is you know this is actually the downtown is one of the few neighborhoods with growing fan like growing numbers of children right now in the city. So it's, it's an interesting problem to have you know. Come back to me and ask, I can get it to you at the end. I have a booklet with a whole bunch of stats that I could pull it out, but I, I can't say right now. Yeah. I think of our bikeway network is about 300 kilometers, so about 250, 240 miles. Um, but that's our entire bikeway network, and maybe 10% of that is protected bike lanes. Um, yes? There's this idea called the minimum grid. Uh, is this something that's informing your decisions here? Uh, I mean, uh, it's something we're keeping in mind is just ensuring that there are those connections, um, how we get, to, how we are linking where people are riding to where they want to go. And that's really where we'll see our, the newest protected bike lane network is really trying to protect, connect, you know, our bridge infrastructure into the downtown. How do those connect to the destinations people want to go to? Um, I think one of the main things that we're going to be looking at is, you know, where are some of the worst places to ride today where we have a lot of people riding bikes, you know? We have streets where we have a thousand people a day where there's no infrastructure. 
it says that there's a need and as soon as you can deliver that you know you'll see those numbers go up so trying to pinpoint where to make those investments is, but some of them are in the downtown some of them are two miles out of downtown so it's uh, yeah Um, I know from, uh, I think it was from 2008 to 2012, we had collisions went up, number of bike vehicle collisions went up, but collision rates are going down. So we had, uh, it was down by 17% over four years. And what we're seeing is the more people riding, again, you know, your baseline numbers of collisions go up because there's more interactions and more people, but your rates go down. Um, and I know uh, colleagues from the University of BC that would have some more stats on, you know, severity of collisions. A poster session later today. Even. Yes. Tell me a little about the streetscaping component, like, like the the planters that make it look great. Uh, what do they cost to maintain? Who looks after them? So the planters were are looked after by the city. Uh, we have our I think believe our parks group is out there. They were put in mostly just in the downtown where we had protected bike lanes um, because of concerns of the downtown merchants about how it would make the street look just to have concrete. Um, I don't have numbers on, on maintenance, but that was a really important thing for getting a selling point to the downtown. Um, they've been fairly expensive to maintain because we have to water them, but on the flip side, you know, they've allowed us to do a lot more. And people see it and they say that, you know, it, it's a positive influence on the street. So, so, so when the water box in the Jersey Barrier. Yeah, that was, yeah, <laughs> that was a trial there for somewhere else, I think. When they're watering, are they, they're bringing in a water tank truck, I assume, yeah. and so are they in the bike lane and blocking the bike lane, I, or where, where? How do they do that and not I don't disrupt know, the flow it, of traffic? Yeah, I believe they do it at night. Okay. So it's done by city crews. I believe it's at night, and they just. I think I believe they just use the vehicle lanes. And the way these work is they have a reservoir on the bottom, so they just there's a tap on the side, and they fill it up. They just take the truck along and just top them all up. So that's an ongoing issue, and I think in every is, you know, five years ago was trying to work with our, you know, our own partners in the city about not using the bike lanes to park in, you know, to armored vehicles. And again, it's just a culture change. It takes time, and you know, over time, it's just more people biking. It's become less and less of an issue, but we still see it. You know, you can still see it every day. Where you know, if you go look around, yeah. Yes. You had mentioned that um, the separated bike lane that we were on in the beginning. Um, started out as a temporary project. That's right. Um, I was curious how long that temporary installation was and kind of what the community response was to it, whether it hurt or helped your case and if that was like the intention all along to kind of like demonstrate, hey look, Carmageddon didn't happen or whatever, so. Yeah, so this, um, it's a good question. So yeah, both the Dunsmere and the Hornby Street bike lanes were installed as a temporary trial. Um, they were supposed to be in place for one year before we reported back to council. Um, this is the t this is pretty well the permanent the temporary installation. You know those concrete bar those concrete medians and the and the planters and all the traffic signal work was part of the trial. The, tr the two bike lanes cost four million dollars. Um, so it was a trial. We could remove it if there was major backlash, but it wasn't going to be an easy feat. Yeah. And that was part of the you know, that was part of the process. We didn't want to. You know, if it's a trial and too easy to remove, you know, you'll get the pushback to remove it right away. Um, you know, I think one of the best stories I could use locally is, so the Burrard Street Bridge, um, back in 1997, I believe, we had a council the day that said they put in a bike lane. They was supposed to be in for three months over the summer, uh, back in 2012. And when that was done, they were parking on both sides of the street and a really awkward bike box at the intersection of Main Street there. And that main and Union intersection was one of the top 10 uh, vehicle bicycle collision locations in the city. So we embarked on a process to put in protective facilities on this one block where the businesses are and carry separation, which will ride on our way back uh, down. And as you go down that street, which is now closed, um, you can turn left, which leads directly to our seawall, or you can go straight, which we will, to our Carroll Street Greenway and into Gastown. So this one, uh, it's about 0.8 kilometer project linked existing AAA facilities and provided just a lot of connectivity and that big gap. Um, but it was a big fight. This one block is, you know, it's very quiet right now, but it, it's a truck route. And because of this, because of these structures, it serves some really important kind of connectivity in the neighborhood. And these businesses here, this went through a revitalization about the same time we doing the bike lane. So most of the businesses had only been in operation for about six months and they came to do the consultations. 
so they were very concerned just about any changes to the street. Uh, originally, we were planning a protected bike lane in each direction, uh, but based on network connectivity concerns, we ended up making this direction shared with vehicles, uh, and we were okay with that because the vehicle volumes are actually quite low in that direction. Uh, it's about 500 a day going east, you know, or thousands going the other direction. Uh, this path was kind of built in that same form, just to say, because we, from the political side, weren't happy that we backed down from making this bikes only. So this path was put in just that, you know, if people weren't comfortable on that one block of the street, they could come in here and ride this. Yeah. Now, one of the things that this path, though, is this site here is one of the big issues, reasons to removing the viaducts as well. So this city block, along with more on the other sides, would now become um, housing and more businesses. So that's one of the big pushes, again, to take the viaducts down. Again, just opening up land that's underutilized in terms of these roads and find new ways to provide affordable housing in the city and reconnect these neighborhoods. Um, for, this was actually when this was built, um, this was a thriving uh, neighborhood here. It was actually the, it was the black community in the city here called Hogan's Alley. So just right where this landed. There's a couple signs right along here that kind of commemorate that, but you know, it's, there's a lot of scars in this city. And actually, this neighborhood we're going to ride into along with our Chinatown were the main reasons that the freeways didn't go through and that these didn't connect all the way out to the east, which uh, you know, would have changed the look of our city for many years. So we're very fortunate uh, that we're in this place. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah. You know, when it actually when it opened, I heard quite a few stories that police were handing out tickets for people riding in the bike lane. Uh, it's somewhat ambiguous, which again, when we did the design, you know, I was okay with that. Uh, people drive slower on it because of this, and people have actually chosen not to ride here, but not to drive here because of it. Uh, here looks like the first big station here. You actually see you know, people going yell at the cars, like, oh, it's a road. You know, you can use it. So we're, uh, but we might come back again. We're going to be doing improvements to this bikeway all the way to the east. We might now come and make this bike only if we can. Now that it's been in place for about four years, you can say, well, the sky didn't fall. You know, let's just make it for bikes only now. They're, they're things up. How wide is it? How wide is it? Uh, the lane is three meters. So, what's the beautiful line? Uh, that direction is about 500 cars a day. Uh, the other way is you know, 2,500, 2,000. I checked. Would that change if the viaduct is taken down? Uh, everything will, yeah. Don't know how it'll change, but. Because, <laughs> yeah, if, if the viaducts go, that's, I mean, that's an arterial street there, that's uh, prior. It will become the main street that connects into the new streets that connect to Georgia, into the downtown. So, you know, the bigger issues we'll be dealing with is this will now be residential, commercial. You yeah, know, that's the bigger challenge, I think, than more circulation traffic versus a through fair. It'll actually, with the viaducts, it would actually remove the arterial component of the street. So that would give you the opportunity to get more right of way and just build this out the way you want it to be. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if we get any more right of way from our planning department, but maybe fewer cars, you know. But yeah, lots of opportunities. Big, big, uh, big changes. So, but as we keep going, um, so one of the next projects we have coming up will be, um, and this is a, as a mini park. And this was actually in contradiction to the freeway. So um, the federal government had put up money to build a highway when the residents fought it down and it basically it turned out the money was there and they installed these linear parks and they actually put a whole bunch of closures in. So it was kind of the best outcome I'd say out of not getting a freeway for a neighborhood was they actually got a number of traffic calming elements and more green space. Um, this park here, when we redesigned, we had to redesign this path in about 2009 there was a small path that went to the middle, very overgrown landscaping, and there were a number of bike pedestrian collisions on the sidewalk on the other side. So we went through an extensive consultation process to develop this little space here. And one of the key goals, as you can see the chicane as you're going down the hill, lets to slow people down. Uh, just because of the hill here, you know, we were reporting people going 40 kilometers an hour at the bottom. So, um, yeah. But now as we build our bikeways, this is really what we're, our goal is, is to have more of these closures, more of these spaces. And that's what we'll be aiming for as we do upgrades along this bikeway.
more lively now. You see people actually sitting on the benches, interacting with people riding. And I think this has had a real positive influence on how people in this neighborhood interact with the bicyclists. Just because before, um, you know, this is often called, it was often called the bicycle freeway. And again, it was this, um, it was this notion back to this freeway that was planned that they tried to stop and then the, the street became the bike route. So it was this, a lot of contention here about how they're not trusting the city. So I think this bit bought at least some goodwill in terms of how we built this with public input and uh, made improvements. Has it always been mixed use? Is there a little grocery over there? I, yeah, that's, I'm not sure it's been there for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple actually in this neighborhood. A couple is another old shop up there that's been there for about 100 years. Wow. Has this park always been here as well? Or? Uh, the park came in as I believe uh, after the freeway construction was stopped. This park was created at the same time. So they torn a house down here for the freeway? Yeah. Well, no, it was um, money that was earmarked for the freeway was used for park development and these closures. So did they purchase a house in Tour Town? I for believe the park? so, yeah. Just for the park? Yeah. So there was never a freeway going. The, go the freeway would have been going this way, this, oh, on the okay. street. Oh, okay. So this street and the next street would have been the freeway. Wow. And then when the money was, um, basically the project cancelled, there was money already allocated, so they used it for improvements in the neighborhood. <laughs> the which? The, the freeway? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, so at the time, the uh, city of Vancouver and the province of British Columbia were pushing very hard for the freeway. And in the end, it was the federal government who yeah. pulled out. Well, they pulled out the money and that was, you know, I've only been able to piece it together because this all happened in the 50s and 60s from talking to people, but huge, um, you know, huge rising out of people in Chinatown, uh, which we'll ride through, and this neighborhood. And, you know, you know what I heard from a histor local historian is, you know, every time an MP was in town, they'd invite them over for a big dinner, they'd have 300 people in the hall wine and dine them and then say, do you know what's happening? Do you know what you're doing to us? And, you know, so I had a lot of these unsuspecting MPs show up until they said, what is going on over there, you know? And that's what ended, ultimately stopped it was um, was the federal government and the community pushback. So the city was pushing very hard to build the freeway, which I think most cities were at the time. Yeah. So Was it a poor neighborhood at that yes. time? Yeah, so it was actually, you know, you know uh, there's a video you can watch on YouTube about Vancouver's urban blight that was published by the city talking about how they would, you know, rip this neighborhood apart and make it better, you know. <laughs> which most cities probably have, but it's, yeah. <laughs>